Good morning. Uh, my name is Adrian Park, and it's uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome you uh, to this month's broadcast of uh, Innovations in Surgery. Uh, we're uh, hosting this uh, uh, broadcast from the Anne Arundel, Anne Arundel uh, Health System in uh, beautiful Annapolis, Maryland. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce um, my uh, friend and colleague and uh, co-editor-in-chief of uh, uh, the journal we edit together, uh, Lee Swanstrom. Lee uh, needs no introduction to this uh, audience. Uh, he's uh, just made a, a move now to Strasbourg, France, where he's the Director of Surgical Innovation and Technology Transfer. And uh, Lee is going to be talking to us today on peroral endoscopic myotomy. Uh, is this the new gold standard for achalasia? Uh, Lee. Uh, thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Phil, for the invitation to be here. It's uh, wonderful to join you. Um, it's a very cool, crisp day here in Strasbourg, but sunny, which is uh, unusual. So I'm very happy to, to join everybody. Okay. Uh, I think um, I was given the topic to talk about uh, something that's near and dear to my heart, which is uh, an interventional endoscopic procedure, uh, one of those numerous um, procedures that are slowly replacing um, open or lap even laparoscopic surgery. So we'll talk today about uh, treatment of achalasia. And uh, Adrian asked me to make this very interactive, so I'd certainly encourage um, uh, encourage any questions and, and happy to pause, pause at any time uh, to hopefully answer them, including from the audience here at ERCAD in Strasbourg. I thought I would start with a case presentation, uh, hopefully a fairly typical case. Uh, uh, this is somebody that we saw fairly recently and um, uh, just kind of maybe walk through the thought processes to get a, a treatment plan. So a 21-year-old uh, Woman presents with increasing problem swallowing and describes spitting up this very typical white foam in the mornings. Uh, no weight loss, and interestingly enough, it's only started six months ago, which is, is actually fairly typical. She also complained of heartburn for over three years, and uh, actually two uh, years ago, her PPI or her PCP put her on a PPI uh, treatment, of course. Uh, they start PPIs on almost everybody, so maybe that's not that important of a clue. So I might, um, Adrian, um, open it up for questions uh, or recommendations for testing on um, this kind of patient. Well, that's a, that's a, a, a great place to pause, Lee. Let's, let's try um, uh, going to our friends at uh, Mount Sinai in uh, New York. Here. Great, uh, Barry. Uh, looking, looking forward to to uh, hearing how you might approach uh, um, such a patient. Well, they they almost. First of all, it's nice to see everybody. Um, it's not so well. It is going to be a sunny day here, and it is a little cool in New York. Um, it's your Lee is absolutely correct. It's a very typical patient that that we would see. Most of the people who come to us uh, get the, have, have had the evaluation even before they walk in the door, um, because the uh, motility issues are sort of uh, segregated here a little bit and not in one one complete group. But by and large, someone like this is uh, uh, going to fall in the hands of a gastroenterologist, and you can bet for sure they're going to have an endoscopy. And if you're someone who's astute, they're going to know that there's a some difficulty in getting through the uh, GE junction, and then they're going to either send them for motility or they're going to do a barium swallow, one of the one or the other. And of course, that will eventually lead to a motility study of some sort, whether it be one of the older models or whether it will be one of the newer models. And and, uh, and uh, that is key to making the diagnosis. You have to have obviously a peristalsis. Pressure down at the lower end of the esophagus is not the most important thing. It's a peristalsis. So that that's what we would do. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Barry. Um, Lee, um, why don't you why don't you continue with what you did with this patient? So I think Barry uh, outlined that very nicely and exactly. And uh, these things do follow in a fairly uh, regular uh, progression. Don't. I think one of the first screening tests uh, that Don't. anybody would order, and often ordered by the primary care provider, of course, is a, a good barium swallow. I think in patients like this, it's very uh, important to do these in a um, um, 
proper manner. Uh, sometimes upper GIs are, are of low quality and sometimes they're of high quality. But we like a, a timed barium swallow with the patient upright. Um, and um, obviously you have to be a little bit careful of uh, poor emptying esophagus um, as uh, they can aspirate and you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, followed up, of course, by an EGD. Um, if this would have been a 60-year-old patient, I'd actually swap the order uh, on that uh, because, of course, you'd worry mostly about esophageal cancer uh, in somebody in the later decades, but obviously a 20-year-old is highly unlikely to have that. And the EGD is mostly to, to uh, look for any uh, exacerbating conditions that would uh, contraindicate a surgical intervention such as esophagitis, uh, uh, delayed gastric emptying or something like that. And then manometry, uh, Barry mentioned that that was uh, uh, the hallmark. That's the only way you can actually define uh, achalasia. It's a manometric diagnosis. Um, upper GIs have some pathognomonic signs, but they're not 100% accurate, um, and manometry is really the definition. And 20, I put a 24-hour pH there because some people uh, um, will say that that should be gotten, but uh, we feel pretty strongly that it's a, not a useful test in achalasia. It's uh, very often fa false positive um, and can just confuse the issue, Probably since the majority, over 60% of achalasia patients do complain of heartburn. I might just uh, show a couple examples of what these studies would look like. This is a very fairly advanced case of achalasia, a little bit of sigmoidization. Um, of the esophagus, um, this is a patient that needs fairly uh, urgent intervention and is probably going to have uh, less of a good result uh, than somebody with a normal caliber esophagus. But once again, you can see that tapering of the distal esophagus, distension, dilatation, and lengthening of the esophagus. Endoscopy actually typically looks pretty normal. Um, their their um, esophagus, if it's not terribly dilated, can be empty. Uh, not necessarily full of food, although this can be. And the reflex view of their valve uh, would be show a, a hill grade one uh, valve typically. And you can tell in this one that it looks a little snug around the scope. So perhaps you can tell that it's a little bit uh, tighter than, than usual. But achalasia is often mis missed on an endoscopy. And finally, um, um, uh, manometry is very important. This is in high resolution impedance. Uh, manometry, so which is what we pretty much use, and it shows the hallmarks, um, hallmarks of um, achalasia with uh, simultaneous contractions. Here you can see the EUS, upper esophageal sphincter, simultaneous contraction, no relaxation, no receptive relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, and in this case, fairly high pressure lower esophageal sphincter. I don't know if there's any questions about that. Um, let's uh, let's uh, go, if we can, for a minute to our colleagues at uh, at Carolinas Medical Center. Um, good morning. Um, just uh, I, I don't know who wants to take this question. If you want to pick on a fellow or uh, uh, Dr. Stephanie, nice to see you there. Um, uh, what's your what's your approach to uh, um, uh, first of all, how many how many as surgeons, interestingly, uh, scope their scope your patients pre-op or, or do regular uh, endoscopy, and have an interest in, uh, in in motility at your center? How, how's this? Uh, how's that approach? Esophageal motility disorders. Not many. Uh, not many surgeons here. Adrian, this is Todd Hennifer. Not many surgeons here uh, do oh, hey, their Tom. own uh, motility studies. But many of, uh, many of the, the surgeons will actually continue to do and still do uh, endoscopy, uh, upper endoscopy and lower endoscopy. Most of these patients, however, come from their primary care physicians through the, through the gastroenterologist, of course. I don't want to. I don't want to steal uh, Lee's thunder here, but uh, uh, when when you have an, uh, an achalasia patient, um, uh, how often have they come to you uh, either of had, having had a Botox injection or uh, dilatations, and uh, have you been able to uh, convince your your colleagues in your own uh, kind of culture of care there uh, to move these uh, patients quicker to you, or are you still seeing them after multiple uh, endoscopic interventions? When I first uh, when I first got to Charlotte, uh, about 85% of the patients had had at least one procedure 
and about 50% of the patients, either uh, dilation or Botox injection, had had three or more procedures. And now it's, it's flip-flopped. Now only about 15% of the patients will have had something done uh, other than a, you know, a 20 millimeter balloon uh, before they come to us. So it really and truly yes. has become a surgical disease here. And I think that the influence of that truly has been because we've been able to do it minimally invasively uh, has shifted the tide uh, uh, to surgical intervention as the primary, uh, primary point of focus. One of the things that we use Botox for now is if there is a question of a diagnosis. Not all of these patients will actually have, uh, will look truly like achalasia as described in the book. And we use Botox occasionally as a diagnostic procedure. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, Lee, you may have a little uh, uh, convincing to do because we've got some folks that are very happy with uh, a minimally invasive uh, uh, approach to uh, achalasia. And why don't you continue, Lee? Thank you, Todd. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Todd made an interesting comment that he uses Botox for diagnosis. You'll notice in my options for achalasia treatment, I didn't even list Botox, mostly because I, I base this around a 20-year-old uh, patient, and uh, Botox, of course, is a temporary treatment um, uh, and does lead to some scarring of the lower esophageal sphincter and can cause some difficulties in, in the surgery. So I think certainly if it's a a 90-year-old patient or somebody that just had a heart attack uh, or somebody who presents acutely obstructed Botox uh, has a role, um, but I'm, I'm not sure about diagnostic. I've, I've not heard that. Indiana. Traditionally, the options uh, that are out there, as Todd mentioned, uh, are balloon dilatation. Um, it has its pluses. Uh, it's easy and outpatient. It's fairly effective, actually. Uh, about 70%, 60 to 70% um, relief of dysphagia with the first treatment. Uh, it does, uh, if the uh, more effective it is at relieving dys dysphagia, the more GERD it causes. And I think the real thing that's uh, dampened enthusiasm for it is the 5%, 3 to 5% uh, perforation rate. Uh, usually these can be treated medically, but on occasion it's uh, emergent surgery and diversions and esophagectomies and can be a, a pretty ugly scene. So for that reason, I, I totally agree with Todd. Uh, certainly in the United States, nationally, um, balloon dilatation has lost uh, uh, a lot of traction. And now the majority of uh, patients are treated with a surgical heller myotomy, and in most cases, uh, laparoscopically. I might make a, a, a point that uh, here in Europe, it's not quite that way yet. Uh, balloon dilatation is still very uh, popular, and the majority are still um, treated with balloon dilatation. And actually, I've heard from our gastroenterologist recently, there's a, a publication that compared balloon dilatation to uh, Heller myotomy, um, which uh, made it look cheaper and, and uh, equally as effective as Heller myotomy. So it's kind of reawoken that uh, debate um, once again. And everybody, I presume, uh, pretty much everybody knows about laparoscopic Heller myotomy. Uh, first described by Carlos Pellegrini as a transthoracic approach um, in the early 90s, uh, but now almost universally done as a laparoscopic approach. Um, it used to be a little bit of a controversy where you had to uh, add a fundal plication to it, but I think by and large everybody adds a partial fundal plication to it uh, because uh, a simple myotomy probably has a GERD rate of upwards of 60% low recurrence rate, high efficacy, and for that reason, it's really become the gold standard uh, as of yet. Uh, it is pretty skill-dependent. Uh, achalasia is a rare disease, happens about 1 in 100,000 people, um, so you don't need every single hospital uh, as a Heller myotomy center. So this tends to be clustered in uh, centers that uh, specialize in esophageal surgery. I might mention the balloon dilatation is not... Uh, uh, what you usually think of a balloon, the dilatation with a through-the-scope balloon, uh, which the maximum size is 20 millimeters. This is a, a Rigiflex. It's a uh, extremely strong balloon, um, volume controlled, and it uh, doesn't go through a scope, so it's done under fluoroscopic control, although typically we'll pass a scope down beside it and kind of watch it, as you can see on the left of the screen. And it's very force, forceful dilatation. It comes in three centimeter, three and a half centimeter, and four centimeter balloons. 
and there's advocates of, of each size. Um, obviously, the bigger it is, the more successful it is and the higher your perforation rate is. Likewise, uh, uh, laparoscopic heller myotomy, I think most people are familiar with. Um, um, uh, a very elegant, very nice procedure um, going in, mobilizing the distal esophagus, anterior stomach wall, um, dividing the uh, full thickness of the muscle layers of the uh, lower esophageal sphincter and extending it well onto the stomach, uh, two to three centimeters, and well onto the normal esophagus, uh, once again, uh, uh, three to six centimeters. Some people have a good extremely long myotomies which I think we've moved away a little bit. Uh, the key, though, is to divide the lower esophageal sphincter mechanism, which includes the uh, circular and the sling fibers or diagonal fibers. And here you can see a completed myotomy with the vagus nerve crossing, crossing over. Very thorough uh, job. I, I, in that case, I was actually using bipolar scissors, um, um, which I, I like to use to do it, but everybody has their own. I know Barry... Uh, Salky uh, uses uh, two Marilyns and does kind of an evulsion technique. Other people use a hook. Got anything? Bernard Delmagno, who's here with me, uses a, a hook. No? No, he's using the ligature now. So, so both of those, uh, balloon dilatation um, and laparoscopic heller myotomy, have their good points and their bad points, but neither is perfect. What would be really nice is to uh, provide the precision of a surgical myotomy um, with the um, patient friendliness of an endoscopic procedure. And that certainly has been the trend, and that's what I'm going to focus my talk on. This is actually nothing new. Um, Ortega described an endoscopic myotomy in the treatment of achalasia back in 1980 and wrote actually a series of papers on it, a uh, small, small volume. And he actually did it in a, a different way that took a lot of boldness. He actually cut through the mucosa and through the muscle um, and essentially just flayed open the distal esophagus from the inside, which uh, is pretty amazing. He got, did 17 patients without a uh, problem because the um, if you've ever looked at the esophagus from the inside to the outside, the uh, longitudinal layer um, and the serosa is very, very thin. So he must have done a very precise job. I think because of the scariness of this, this never really caught on, but uh, it, it, certainly the idea was out there. We started in, in uh, 2006, 2007 uh, doing flexible mediastinoscopy and doing some, uh, as part of our notes work, uh, doing myotomies because the esophagus was very easy to dissect out, distal esophagus, and um, uh, be able to do a myotomy. And here you can see in a porcine model, uh, dividing uh, the distal esophageal mucosa, essentially replicating a laparoscopic myotomy, but doing it with flexible, flexible endoscope. And then uh, group uh, J. Pashrika, whose name is misspelled there, sorry about that, J. And uh, uh, Peter Cotton, Anthony Kalu, and several others uh, did this paper that uh, really is a hallmark of describing a new technique was based on their notes efforts of whether they were they were creating a flap and tunneling uh, to exit uh, the organ, first the stomach and then the esophagus, uh, with the theory that this flap would cause uh, would seal the exit route and that you wouldn't have to do a formal closure. They published a series of uh, different procedures uh, using this approach, and one of those was uh, performing a, a myotomy. Uh, circular muscle myotomy on that. Uh, Silvana Peretta, who's here in the room, uh, also uh, was around the same time exploring this uh, similar thing, uh, doing a tran transesophageal or transgastric approach uh, to performing a Heller myotomy. So everybody had the same idea that this might be a good uh, approach and work it out. And I think um, uh, this particular group of gastroenterologists um, uh, really hit the nail on the head and came up with the most uh, elegant um, most elegant solution of all. Essentially, then, once again, what they do is make the mucosal incision quite high in the esophagus, create a tunnel down through the submucosal layer, and then on the way back, divide the circular muscle fibers uh, and leave the longitudinal layers intact. So it's really a targeted therapy 
that just divides the disease muscle fibers uh, of the lower esophageal sphincter. And this is really the man that uh, uh, pioneered this, uh, Haru Inoue, um, a brilliant surgeon, a surgical endoscopist and a laparoscopic surgeon, uh, really the father of uh, EMR and ESD, um, published and presented uh, his cases uh, in 2008, actually presented at DDW. He was called a cowboy, as you can see here. He really is at, at times. Uh, but uh, he, he described this, four cases uh, using an ESD technique, uh, going down, dividing the circular muscle layers. Uh, Pashrika and his group uh, just described an animal model, um, as, as I mentioned. So he was the uh, first one to do it in, in um, humans, as far as we know. You never know that for sure. But has uh, no doubt has the largest um, uh, series of these procedures uh, there is uh, uh, over 160 uh, endoscopic Heller myotomies at this point. He has uh, published a little bit of outcomes literature, but not very much. I apologize for the quality of this slide, but it shows uh, a, a few of his patients that have come back for postoperative motility and shows uh, uh, improvement in the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. And I'll show uh, other studies a little bit later. Um, Adrian, any questions about kind of the history and background of all this? Perfect, yeah, perfect time to pause. I, I want to go up to uh, Dalhousie uh, University. Dalhousie. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll not pick on Dr. Ellsmere if he's there, but I'd like to hear uh, from Dr. Ellsmere, one of the um, surgeons who spent some time in the notes arena. Uh, Jim, is this, is this notes, is this a notes procedure? Is this, uh, is this surgery, is it endoscopy? What is this? Well, if uh, notes, I guess, is transluminal, so it's fairly definitional. I, I don't know if we're uh, completely crossing the lumen here, so we're, we're stuck in the lumen and uh, we're providing therapy, so I don't know if it constitutes notes. I think it would fall under the category of uh, therapeutic endoscopy. Um, and, um, you know, it's still, it's still very early in its uh, adoption phase. Um, it's uh, an, an exciting a technology, one that um, it's going to require uh, considerable thought about how you kind of roll out and how you train the individual to do. I do a fair amount of uh, therapeutic endoscopy. I do a fair amount of uh, foregut laparoscopy and um, tend to be fairly aggressive uh, uh, approaching things endoscopically, but this is one that I I wouldn't embark on without uh, spending a fair amount of uh, time uh, training under training under a master, um, and then of course, you know, uh, it, it it'd be a hard. There'd be a few places in the world where you can get a considerable amount of volume uh, to, to you know from a training point of view to to uh, to uh, adopt this uh, technology. So it's it's uh, it's uh, it raises a, a lot of interesting challenges from a from a rolling out point of view. But I think it's. Uh, Certainly, uh, uh, when you look at it from a concept, it's it, from, particularly from an endoscopic uh, concept, uh, it's uh, it's it's very very intriguing and, and uh, um, it's, a, it's a, certainly an exciting development in, in the world of therapeutic endoscopy. Thanks, Jim, uh, and some some interesting points there. How do you, with such a uh, an uncommon disorder, um, kind of ascend the, the kind of learning curve that that uh, you need to for this. We're going to hear from Lee in just a second. Now, can we go to uh, Hopkins? Um, it's been uh, a lot of notes work out of Hopkins, and um, I want to see if we've got any of our colleagues there who can uh, address the same uh, question. I see Dr. Marone there. Um, <clears throat> Mike, where do you where do you feel this falls? And and uh, when Dr. Elsmere talked about therapeutic endoscopy. For better or worse, we often think that's the domain of GI medicine here um, in, in this country. Uh, I obviously am a strong proponent of GI surgeons being uh, assertively in the endoluminal domain. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Okay. Actually, Lee, while we're waiting for him to, uh, him, uh, for Mike's, Mike to work, um, can you, I wanted to ask Bernard, who's in your audience there, just maybe we can get some, uh, some good uh, debate going even uh, within NearCAD. Uh, can can we can we talk to Bernard a sec, uh, Dr. Danmang, and uh, 
uh, like his thoughts on on where um, where this lies, and who should be doing this. Uh, hello, Adrian. Um, hi, good question. Uh, you know, we, we've been involved in the development of nodes for a while. So uh, with uh, Silvana, we've been working a lot in the, uh, in the esophagus. So for us, it's quite clear that uh, that's something that is, should be done by the surgeon because uh, the risks are not zero. And uh, probably you have to, be, to have uh, a good forward surgeon just around you uh, in order to be able to uh, check or to repair if a major problem is uh, occurring during this uh, very uh, operative, operator dependent uh, technique. Uh, I know uh, Lee, I know uh, Inoue, I know the, the, uh, the, the quality of uh, the endoscopy that they can do, but uh, I don't think that this is a technique that can be spread among the gastroenterologists who have uh, no idea at all about the anatomy of the mediastinum and the risk of a mediastinum. And uh, so personally, I think that's, that's really typical, typically uh, uh, a procedure that should be done by the surgeon. Great, well, thank uh, you. I, I, go ahead. I might ask him, Adrian, based on your experience in the lab, you've probably trained more surgeons to do this um, transesophageal or intraesophageal, what would you guess the learning curve is for either a surgeon that doesn't do flexible endoscopy or a surgeon that does flexible endoscopy and laparoscopic hyalurmyotomy? Do you have a guess how many cases would be reasonable? Or I, I think that we should ask the question to uh, Silvana because Silvana has been working a lot on that and probably she knows a little bit more about the time that she need to uh, be quite comfortable with the technique because uh, you know that she's still demonstrating this uh, technique during all the courses here in ACAD. So I don't know. We, we ask her the question. Well, well I think that a heteromyotomy is, uh, is an operation. It doesn't matter how you do it, but you have to know exactly how uh, the anatomy you have to do, uh, you have to know what to do. I think that surgeons are rather comfortable, even if they never touch an endoscope. They, they learn very quickly, quicker than endoscopists could learn a surgical procedure. They know where to go, they know what to do. The question is, I think, as it was mentioned before, uh, you have to do the first cases under a master, somebody that can teach you exactly uh, step by step how the procedure should look like and somebody who is uh, capable of telling you when to stop. Great, uh, some great comments. Thank you, uh, Savannah and, uh, and Bernard. Uh, too bad we don't have some. Let's go back to Hopkins for a second. Uh, uh, I, I wish uh, Dr. Clue was in the audience with you there, Mike, to spice things up a little bit. Um, I will also just remind our, our uh, the rest of the audience, we've got a number at the bottom of the screen. Please um, call in with questions or comments. But let's go to um, Hopkins briefly. Mike, are, is, your, is your mic working? How about now? I feel like there I'm rising at me now. Okay. <laughs> so I'll try to represent Tony first, who would say, oh, yeah, we can do this. Um, this is relatively straightforward. But the reality is this is really challenging. And I, I think um, Lee did a really elegant job of giving the overview. Um, and even just to share a couple of technical aspects, when Dr. Inouye was here a couple of months ago, um, we did one clinical patient and then did three in the lab. And it was fascinating what we learned in the lab that there are some additional hazards that aren't written about much in what's out there so far, but um, even the potential for ripping the mucosal otomy um, as you're working and extending the, the, the repair on that side of what you've got to close um, is a real issue. And I agree with Silvana that this is just something you really have to train with a master. Um, and I emphasize also that um, in a way as a surgeon, um, he's a surgical endoscopist, and when he and I were talking, he emphasized the importance that as this rolls out, and he kind of shared the view that it probably shouldn't be a universal offering, that it's really going to have to be either a team sport or people like Lee, like a lot of the surgical endoscopists who have superb skills on both sides because you really need that, yes. that complement. The other thing, just from a concept standpoint, I do think this is going to have a role in selected master hands, um, but then patient selection, because the patients that we see often with a significant 
um, paraesophageal hernia or hiatal hernia. Um, I'm not sure what the dynamics are going to be with this as a solution for those patients. Um, that said, um, because we're not doing as much dissection at the GE junction from the outside, um, this may have a role in selected patients with better outcomes um, and even less impact than what we do laparoscopically. Okay, uh, before we go back, Lee, um, we've got a question at uh, Mount Sinai in New York. Can we go to Mount Sinai for, uh, for a second here? Thanks, Mike, for your comments. Um, I don't know. I don't know who to address it to, but hi. Um, I don't know who to address the question to, but probably Silvana, I would think, um, or Lee, um, or maybe Bernard. What are the bad things that can happen? What are the and have you seen them yet? Yeah, um, Lee. Yeah, I actually, I actually have a little bit of a discussion about complications, and I'll run through our list of complications, which is. <laughs> Uh, and, and certainly don't want to minimize uh, the fact that there can be complications with this. Um, so if, if you'll hang with me just a little bit, Barry, I'll, I'll kind of go through that in fairly detail after I kind of talk about the technique. Uh, I might okay. address indications uh, that Mike brought up. Uh, in a way, would disagree with that. He's done reoperative. He's, he's done poem procedures on patients who've had open uh, Heller myotomies. He's done patients with sigmoid esophagus. He's done full-length myotomies and uh, DES patients. Um, and, and kind of based on that, we, we didn't, in our IRB um, submission, we didn't exclude patients who had had previous interventions, balloon dilatation or Botox. Um, but we have subsequently found that they are a little bit more challenging. So just to comment about indications. I, I think um, uh, my feeling now uh, with some moderate experience with this is that it's a pretty universal procedure. I think if a patient qualified for laparoscopic Heller myotomy uh, that they qualify for a poem. Um, I was even talking to somewhat, someone um, the other day that did one, their fourth poem actually had a parasophageal hernia. And they went ahead and did the poem. The patient actually did did quite well. It wasn't real symptomatic from their paraesophageal hernia, uh, but their thought would, was to do that to kind of fine work, uh, get the dysphagia relieved, and then if they needed uh, a repair of their paraesophageal hernia, just go in and do that laparoscopically later. Thank you. Why don't you go ahead and uh, uh, continue your presentation? So. Uh, we started doing this, uh, and it, I think anybody that does this should do it under an IRB protocol. Early on, we're going to want everybody to publish their results. Uh, it's a rare disease, and just to get the numbers so uh, some fellow can do a meta-analysis uh, and really give us a, a broader picture would be important. Uh, our IRB was actually not just for achalasia. It's also for primary motility disorders like DES or high-pressure high, um, hypertensive lower esophageal sphincter syndrome. One of the things we wanted to do is uh, really test these patients. I'm a great believer in objective outcomes data in esophageal surgery. And so we called for a pretty extensive preoperative and postoperative testing in ours. Um, in a way, because his patients are coming from all over Asia, uh, really doesn't have good, solid objective outcomes data. He has um, symptomatic uh, data that was collected uh, with mostly telephone calls because these patients are totally well within a week. And uh, because of that, it's hard to really get a, a feel for uh, what's going on. His papers uh, mention a very rare uh, reflux rate, um, less than 5% uh, GERD, and a very low complication rate. Um, our exclusion rates were extreme old age and extreme young age and the usual contraindications. Um, and we kind of elected not to attempt to really end-stage esophagus, i.e., if a patient needs an esophagectomy, um, we're not going to try to do a poem on them. But we specifically didn't exclude Botox, uh, dilatations, uh, obesity, or any other uh, surgeries, non-esophageal non surgeries. Uh, for preparation, uh, of course, we test them, as I mentioned, uh, manometry, EGD, and time barium swallow. 
Um, off NSAIDs, blood thinners, 24 hours of clear liquids because they do hold on to food in their esophagus. And even with that, we often have to clean out the esophagus and uh, a dose of antibiotics. And you'll notice uh, five days of nice statin um, mouthwash. And that's because uh, one of our earliest cases uh, where Silvana flew all the way from France to come and watch a case. Unfortunately, we put the scope in. The patient had uh, uh, candidiasis. And we had to postpone that case and bring him back another day. So now we pre-treat all the patients because that is a fairly common finding. The equipment's actually fairly basic. Um, um, I, I think a high-quality endoscope, and we always use a, a high-definition endoscope. Uh, most of the scope companies make these uh, now, and it really gives you an edge, I think, at seeing those fine fibers. I like to use an overtube. Uh, when I do these because you do go in and out uh, quite a bit and that minimizes the trauma to the patient, I think. It's not absolutely necessary. Uh, injection needle, as you would use for uh, sclerotherapy for um, esophageal varices. A needle knife cautery, like you'd use for a pre-cut sphincterotomy. So common, common tools, off the shelf, if you will. A dissecting cap, which is not a common tool and uh, really kind of uh, turns the uh, endoscopy lab and the OR room upside down because they're hard to get your hands on and it's an important component of it but it's a cap that fits on the tip of the scope and provides your traction and counter traction um, as you do this essentially one hand surgery. And then an insulated tip, a triangle tip or a hook cautery knife uh, which are also very hard to get your hands on. In the United States uh, these have not been commercially available until just a couple weeks ago. Um, so I used to stuff my suitcase uh, full of instruments when I go to Japan and, and uh, come back and, and bring them in. And then endoscopic clips, as are, are usually used. I, I threw this picture, and this is a photo I took of um, um, Haru Inoue's uh, back table. And you can see another very important tool in the middle of that, which is his toothbrush. And uh, it's very good to keep those cautery instruments clean, and the toothbrush seems to be the best way to do it. And you'll see the lifting solution as you'd use for ESD back on his back table as well. Lee, uh, let me interrupt you for a, a sec. Yeah. Sure. We have a question from uh, Carolinas Medical Center. Um, this is uh, Dimitris Stefanidis. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation, which is very interesting. Um, we, I could probably have asked this question later, but it refers to reflux. Um, I know the the opinion is that you know if you don't take down the angle of his, you may not have as much uh, reflux. We do know, and you mentioned that earlier in your presentation, that the main way um, achalasia treatment fails long term is reflux, and even. In the pre-poem era, we recently published the SAGES guideline on achalasia treatment. It took for a long time before it became clear in the literature that you have to add a fund duplication. There were several papers that were arguing you don't have to add fund duplication. And now it's very clear, the evidence is very strong, that you do need to do a fund duplication. Otherwise, you have a higher failure rate long term. I'd like to get uh, Dr. Swanstrom's thoughts on on that aspect, because I understand that at this point we argue that maybe there's not that much reflux, but we won't really know until several years later if that's going to be one of the main Achilles heels of this procedure. Thank you. Lee, let yeah, me just thanks. thank you uh, for that question, uh, Dr. Stefanidis. Um, I was hoping uh, that we were going to have that uh, raised. But Lee, why, I, I want to come back to that maybe at the end of, uh, as you, after you've gone through your um, outcomes and complications, I want to spend a couple of minutes. So maybe we can table it just for a couple of minutes for you to run through uh, your uh, results. OK. Um, let's uh, go ahead and go on with the tech technique. And I, I think that's an excellent question as well and um, certainly worth dwelling on. Um, patients uh, done in the operating room, obviously under general anesthetic because it's uh, around a two-hour procedure, arms tucked, uh, the surgeon stands at the patient's head and typically looks towards the patient's feet, uh, as you can see uh, Professor Inouye doing uh, right here. Uh, that's a fairly important little detail because that keeps your orientation. Uh, when in endoscopy inside the lumen of, of um, 
a hollow organ, it's very hard to keep keep orientation. And one of the ways is to is to orient your body uh, to the scope, and that kind of keeps you uh, oriented. This is a, a fairly brief video of kind of one of our procedures. You can see mapping out. You can see the dissecting cap on the uh, tip of the scope, uh, pulling back uh, several centimeters, typically five or six centimeters above the lower esophageal sphincter, uh, doing a mucosal lift um, with uh, some methylene blue stained uh, saline, using this needle knife cautery to make uh, um, typically a, going in directly like this, I just make a centimeter and a half incision. Uh, now we use a biliary extraction balloon and you do kind of a balloon assisted entry because this can be difficult getting the scope into the plane. Once inside though you can see uh, so we've got muscle layers on the right side of the screen, mucosa on the left side of the screen and much as doing a preperitoneal inguinal hernia you get this areolar tissue uh, that separates fairly easily but does contain some blood vessels, the per perforating vessels that feed the mucosa. Uh, those larger ones will treat with um, a uh, hot biopsy forcep. Smaller ones you can just cauterize uh, with a spray cautery. And this shows using a triangle tip knife uh, which disperses the electrical current and kind of gives you a wider um, uh, application. Uh, make this tunnel, just continue the tunnel down onto the stomach and here you can see a change in the color of the mucosa and of the vascular pattern and it becomes quite clear when you're on the stomach wall. Uh, there's really no question about it. It gets very tight going through the LES and then all of a sudden it opens up quite clearly and the mucosa is a different color. Then backing up, backing up, uh, starting the myotomy, you can see dividing um, the circular fibers, which you can see quite clearly. And this is very similar to doing a laparoscopic heller myotomy. You just fiber by fiber, pick them up and divide them. Uh, the difference though is here you can see the, the longitudinal fibers uh, becoming a, apparent um, right in the center. You can see those uh, longitudinal strands there. Uh, one thing to notice is that they're very widely separated. Uh, longitudinal layer of the esophagus is very insubstantial in most patients. And then once you've divided uh, down onto the stomach wall, uh, we'll use regular clips to close the uh, mucosal incision, uh, which Mike has pointed out sometimes can tear, that can range anywhere from three clips to close it uh, to seven clips or eight clips. And then retroflex, uh, you can tell that you've made it um, well onto the stomach wall because we inject a little bit of methylene blue at the very end. Um, Silvana was kind enough to come out and um, kind of introduce us to the FLIP technology, functional lumen, luminal uh, diameter measurements, which is a measurement really of compliance of lower esophageal sphincter. And uh, we were fortunate to uh, have the machine for a while and did uh, intraoperative monitoring to make sure that we had a good myotomy. And as you can see here, a narrow waist obviously is a narrow lumen. Uh, the color corresponds to pressure and you can see high pressure and post-operatively, immediately post-operatively, you can see a nice uh, relaxation of that and increase in compliance. I think that's how this works. Um, just the results, the acute results, operative time around two hours as I mentioned, but uh, can be longer in more complicated cases. Uh, we had the one case that was post postponed for Canada. We did them uh, a week or so later. Uh, one case uh, had clear achalasia, had uh, endoluminal biopsies of the LES um, with, per our usual procedure. And we got in, dissected down to the LES, and there's clearly a um, cancer at the LES. So this is a pseudoachalasia. Uh, it just simply wasn't picked up endoluminally. Uh, patients we typically send home uh, uh, 24 hours afterwards per protocol. We get an upper GI swallow on them the next day uh, to rule out leaks, gastrograph and swallow, I should say. Uh, we've had a couple patients that stayed a little bit longer for various reasons, no conversions. Um, the vast majority of patients take no pain medication once they leave. And we send them home on a puree diet uh, for a week. These mucosal clips are rather insubstantial and don't want them eating. Um, something solid knocking their clips off uh, on post-op day one. 
I, I think uh, I can't dwell enough on the pain thing. It's one of the most eerie things. A, uh, they instantly have relief of dysphagia. Typically after a laparoscopic hyalurmyotomy, you have a little edema or something that uh, takes a little while to subside, so they have a little bit of dysphagia. Uh, these patients really, the uh, minute they wake up, are, are dysphagia-free for the most part. And this is a, a, a copy of a nursing note, uh, continues to deny pain. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of shocking to the, the surgical recovery nurses uh, and the floor nurses that these patients just have no pain whatsoever, a little bit of a sore throat sometimes, although the overtube has kind of uh, stopped that. Sometimes a little bit of an epigastric ache, um, uh, but not always and, and not enough that would require medical treatment. Um, any, any questions about that, Adrian? Do you want to make any comments or? Um, I, I think I think what we'll do is run run through these. I want to get back to uh, Stephanie's question, um, and then and then um, so why don't you run through, and then we'll have a, a couple minutes for discussion. So, so we have had complications. Everybody that's been doing these um, um, the major centers that doing which would be Northwestern with Nat Soper and. Um, and then uh, UCSD, uh, San Diego, um, has seen complications. Uh, these are a list of ours. Um, some of these are just uh, pretty uh, unremarkable. Others are not. Uh, some sound funny. We lost two of our dissecting caps inside the mucosal tunnel, um, and it took a while to get them dug out. Um, uh, we now have tricks to do that. Um, Every once in a while, you'll get an energy burn to the mucosa, and you can have a mucosal perforation, or you'll just bluntly uh, separate that. We used to mark out our path that we wanted to follow with an injection needle, and we found that the needle holes tended to tear and enlarge when the cap went by them, so we've stopped doing that. Those we simply clip, put a clip on them. They tend to be very, very small uh, perforations. Um, we have had full thickness mediastinal perforation. In fact, that's not all that in common. Uh, these were clearly uh, full thickness perforations. Essentially, there we were doing our notes uh, procedures there and in the mediastinum. These patients did absolutely fine. We didn't do anything particularly different with it and um, uh, just pulled back into the right plane and continued on with the myotomy. Uh, one capnothorax, you'd think it would be fairly common to have a pneumothorax, but it's actually very unusual. It's un very unusual to have any sub-Q air in the neck, uh, and uh, pneumothorax is very unusual. This patient was treated uh, with an angiocath um, um, when the anesthesiologist said uh, breath sounds were distant and uh, did quite fine. I should mention this is clearly is capnothorax and capnoperitoneum because it's very, very important to use CO2 when you do these uh, instead of the usual air pump on the, uh, in, uh, on the um, endoscope. Uh, the... Uh, Capnoperitoneum uh, sometimes doesn't amount to much, but uh, in several of these patients, we've had to put a varus needle into their abdomen and decompress them because it's almost um, almost like a um, um, tension uh, pneumoperitoneum. Um, and I think this happens even even when you don't have a full thickness perforation of the esophagus. And once again, that longitudinal layer is so insubstantial, I think you can get diffusion of gas across it, and it tracks down into the abdomen preferentially. And we have had one serious um, uh, complication, and it was a, a young female that was very similar to the case report that we did. Uh, we were looking at ways to make this more uniformly reliable to surgeons, and we used an extrusion dissection balloon that's designed for ESD. Uh, to create the tunnel, um, and and that uh, was a little bit traumatic in that tract, and it was kind of a, a little bit more of a, a bloody tract. Uh, we dried that up as well as we could, completed the procedure. The procedure went well. patient went home the next day and was readmitted on post-op day three uh, with melana and pretty significant left upper quadrant pain. Her endoscopy showed a blood clot over the mucosotomy, uh, at the distal end of it, she actually had some active bleeding coming from it um, and was controlled with eclipse, kept her a couple days in the hospital. She didn't need a transfusion, but her credit certainly took a hit. And she yeah. saw her just uh, before I came uh, to France, uh, and she's now two and a half weeks out and still has a little bit of left of her quadrant pain. 
Um, so it was definitely a, a complication. Um, results, um, so we bring the patients back at two weeks, uh, two months, and then six months. Uh, we do dysphagia symptom scoring on them. Uh, as you can see, uh, very frequently we have a symptom score of zero, which I'd say is unusual uh, after a laparoscopic myotomy, certainly in the early follow-up. Um, a couple patients had a dysphagia score of two, but overall a, a marked decrease in the um, uh, symptom score for dysphagia. GERD score, we've had uh, six patients complain of at least occasional GERD uh, of this group. 25 said they didn't have any. Six patients uh, uh, came in and, and uh, said that they did have some, some uh, reflux disease. Now, we kind of took this as a grain of salt because uh, most of them didn't have volume regurgitation. Achalasia patients are fairly immune to sensation of regurgitation, we found, because they've lived with it for a while. And uh, uh, this was heartburn, and we know from our experience in anti-reflux surgery that symptoms of heartburn are pretty unreliable. The majority of these patients complained of heartburn um, before they had their surgery, and um, um, most, of, most of those complaints were relieved, and we know that that's not really due to gastroesophageal reflux. So not all of our patients, obviously, have had a six-month follow-up, but the group that has uh, has had their quality of life, symptom assessment, time barium swallows, high resolution manometry, 24 hour pH, and a small subset with uh, endoflip uh, assessment. So, a pretty comprehensive evaluation at six months. Time barium swallow um, showed a dramatic decrease. In fact, uh, we haven't had any patients that had uh, more than a one minute delay in emptying of the esophagus, which is very, very good. 24-hour pH, uh, uh, for the most part, is very normal, um, but not uniformly, and we'll go over the numbers of that. But uh, when it's normal, it looks just like a fundoplication patient. It's just absolutely rock-solid normal with a Demetra score of uh, 4.8, as you can see. Endoscopically, uh, sometimes you get a fairly good hill valve. Sometimes it's fairly wide open like this, uh, but you can still see a fairly sharp angle of hiss. And I think that that does give an anatomic uh, prevention to at least volume regurgitation. Of the 12 patients that a while back had uh, completed their comprehensive evaluation, uh, good dysphagia scores, uh, nine patients had uh, essentially no reflux, but three of the 12 had reflux symptoms. And I think more importantly, on objective follow-up, 30% uh, had at least some uh, reflux. Typically, the mean uh, Demetra score, I believe, in that uh, was only about uh, 18, um, with only one patient having a Demetra score over uh, 30, uh, the others in the, in the teens. So it, it really, um, when you do objective testing, they do have uh, an instance of GERD. Now, I have to say, in our, our laparoscopic Heller myotomy with fundal application, our long-term incidence of re reflux on 24-hour pH testing is almost the same, about 30%. Um, and I think that's more due to the a dysmotility of the esophagus. They have, if you have, have even a small amount of reflux, it tends to stay in the esophagus for a long time, and that bumps your Demeester score up. Lee, let me just uh, just um, ask a, a thing here. We would have to wrap up uh, now, but um, uh, just uh, wanted to. So you, you've addressed um, Dr. Stephanidis' uh, question, and and most of us are familiar with the the, the Richard study and Al's, you know, about uh, several years ago. Uh, that nice perspective uh, trial looking at uh, a lap heller with and without an anti-reflux procedure. And of course, the the those who did not have the anti-reflux procedure uh, ha had a reflux rate almost 50 percent, and those who who had the procedure was uh, less than just under 10 percent. So, um, I think that of the of the skeptics uh, in the, you know in the audience, probably they're hanging on to that. Uh, rightly, a, a real quick comment from you on that. And the other final thing, uh, probably voicing the uh, the view of some of the skeptics in the audience is how, how um, is is this is this a big enough advance? 
um, that were not in the um, in the one port lap coal or the one port uh, coal cystectomy single site coal cystectomy type of discussion where um, it's a long run for for a short slide a lot more difficult are we putting patients at risk are we going to see that that delta in the outcome so uh, maybe just real briefly just address those two I'll take the last one first. I, I think this really is uh, an advance. Uh, it's really an indication that you can cone down the treatment of aplasia. Um, and these patients do fantastic, and they're very appreciative. I, I think, um, you know, the GERD question, uh, these days there's good medical treatment of GERD. Uh, these patients really want their dysphagia relieved, and this is highly effective. And um, uh, I, I think most of them would easily trade taking uh, medication for it. And, uh, you know, I don't think the disparity in GERD is, is that big. And I think as we uh, find out exactly how short we can make these myotomies to relieve the dysphagia, it'll get better and better. Uh, these patients go back to work on post-op day three. Uh, they have absolutely no restrictions whatsoever. Uh, back to work on post-op day three, and I think overall do better. Uh, than a laparoscopic Heller myotomy. And it's a two-hour procedure, so it's really no longer than a, a laparoscopic procedure. It's cheaper um, because you don't have all the disposable laparoscopic instrumentation. So I, I have to vote that this is a better procedure overall than a laparoscopic, at least uh, as we've seen with six-month uh, data. So that, that would be my kind of summation of, of where we're at with that. I think surgeons can learn it. I think uh, Bernard and Silvana have demonstrated that you can take a novice surgeon that doesn't even do any endoscopy and, and get them through a lab in uh, a couple days and probably teach them to do it. I started letting the fellows uh, do the cases after 20. I felt very comfortable uh, myself with doing it. So I think that's that was certainly my learning curve was about 20 cases. Now our fellows do them from start to finish. Um, so uh, I think that's probably about what we did with um, laparoscopic Heller myotomies. Probably did 20 laparoscopic ones before I let a resident or a fellow do it. Great. Well, uh, Lee, thank you so very much for a characteristically uh, enlightening and, uh, and, and compelling uh, presentation. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Swanstrom and the folks at IRCAD and all those who participated today, uh, again, for a very uh, enlightening and stimulating presentation. Th thanks very much. Thank you, Adrian.